Welcome back to On The Move with Victor Shi. This is still Victor Shi, and it is January 6th. Um, we made it to the end of the week. And of course, um, I can't talk about this day without talking about the two-year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection that happened two years ago when Trump summoned a mob to the U.S. Capitol, um, told them to, quote, fight like hell and try to overturn the results of a free and fair election. His supporters followed his words and went to the Capitol building, stormed up the steps, hurting police officers, trampling police officers who um, are actually today going to get the uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. So that's um, good news. But they went to the Capitol building, totally desecrated um, the building and uh, really made a mockery of American democracy. So today is a bit of a solemn day. Um, but at the same time, we also have the House now uh, still struggling to find a speaker. Um, Kevin McCarthy seems like he has some sort of deal with Republicans, but it seems like it's he's not going to have enough votes still to be the next Speaker of the House. So you have on one hand, the Democratic Party today really trying to honor what happened on January 6th. And then you have the mockery that Republicans are still making of the House and of democracy uh, by still trying to you know elect Kevin McCarthy as Speaker. And so you see these two very different realities right now. And um, we're going to talk about that today, as well as some of the new uh, national security things that we should be looking at in 2023. And to help me do that, um, I have with us, uh, David Rothkopf, who is a foreign policy, national security, and political affairs analyst and commentator. He is also a columnist for The Daily Beast, which I urge all of you to check out. He has great columns, which we'll get into today. And he is the author of, get this, 10 books, uh, including his latest one, titled American Resistance, The Untold Story of the Deep State Saved Our Nation. Um, David, thank you so much for joining me today. It's so great to see you. Good to see you. So I want to ask you about January 6th because it's the two-year anniversary today. There's been, um, I think, a lot of good accountability as it relates to the members of Oath Keepers and Proud Boys. And I think the January 6th committee has done a good job of exposing everything um, that happened on that day uh, and also leading up to it and um, and also after January 6th. But I'm wondering from uh, a national security perspective, where are we two years later in terms of the threat to democracy? Well, from, from a national security perspective or from a, a purely American citizen's perspective, uh, I think we should be very concerned about where we are. Uh, the, the man who uh, was the mastermind of the coup attempt is still the leading candidate of the Republican Party. Yeah. Uh, the debate that's currently occurring in the House of Representatives uh, over who should lead them is being led by a group of people who defended that man or who actively participated in that coup attempt. Um, no one who was involved in the planning uh, uh, or leadership of the insurrection uh, was uh, or has been brought to account yet by the justice system. Uh, the, the list of the leaders of the Republican Party uh, is also a list of election deniers. Right. I think we can take some comfort from the fact that the last election, a number of them didn't do so well in in in, in certain states, uh, but broadly within the Republican Party, there continues to be a uh, belief uh, that uh, the election was unfair, although it was not, that the system is unfair, though it's not. Mm -hmm. And the assault on our democracy continues. Yeah. Uh, and frankly, we don't know how it's going to turn out. The 2024 election, uh, uh, who becomes president, what the Supreme Court does next, uh, what states do next. Uh, all these things could, could have a negative effect. So, uh, you know, counter victories, um, but but two years after January 6th, uh, I would argue that the threat to our democracy is greater, not less. So we always uh, we, we often talk about um, accountability and how important accountability is when it comes to January 6th. And um, everyone involved in, in the planning of it and the and, and the actual involvement of January 6th are, are on you know the Capitol steps. What do you think full accountability looks like, though, and how close do you think we are to that? I mean, we, like you mentioned, we still have members of Congress who voted against uh, certifying election results. You still have, um, you know, people who 
participated in January 6th, including the former president who hasn't been held accountable yet. But what do you think full accountability will will look like? Well, hidden in your question were two questions. Um, Because it's what do I think it should look like and what do I think it will look like? Um, uh, The uh, uh, what it should look like is that everybody involved in January 6th uh, ought to be prosecuted and and uh, uh, brought to justice, um, go to jail. I think everybody who was involved in the plot to uh, uh, promote uh, fraudulent electors ought to be prosecuted sent to jail. I think everybody who funded and enabled them, same thing. That means Donald Trump. It means people in his immediate circle. It means people like Ginny Thomas. It means people like Ted Cruz and uh, uh, Lindsey Graham. All of those people, all of those people ought to be out of public life in America, not eligible to run for office and having paid their debt to society. That's not what's going to happen. Um, Trump might get indicted. Trump might get convicted. Uh, he won't get indicted or convicted unless a bunch of the people around him flip and do deals. So those people aren't going to pay the price. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much appetite to go after the people on Capitol Hill uh, who uh, enabled all this. Uh, maybe DOJ will change that, um, but uh, so far there doesn't. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much appetite, even among, you know, aggressive truth tellers about all this, like the January Sixth Committee, to go after people like Ginny Thomas, uh, who were essential to this whole process, funding it, organizing it, getting buses there, promoting it whispering in the ear of powerful people, talking to Mark Meadows, talking to her husband on the Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera. And so <clears throat> only a tiny fraction of the people involved in this are going to ever pay a price for it. In all likelihood, it'll be primarily the people down the totem pole. <clears throat> and most of the others who are behind it will remain powerful, influential, and many of them in high public office. So I, I want to ask you specifically about Donald Trump, um, because it seems like on one hand, he still has a grip on a large chunk of his supporters. Um, like you said, he's the front runner um, in the Republican um, nomination to become president in 2024, hoping that you know he, he gets indicted somehow so that he doesn't have that um, front runner status and, and can't run for president. But on the other hand, it also seems like um, he's losing support from the Republican Party. It, you know, yesterday we, we saw that one vote for Trump to be speaker, and it was from Matt Gates, And um, I'm not sure just how big of a threat he has now, but I'm, I'm wondering what you think of um, the threat that Trump still poses. Is it weakened um, because of, of some of what's happened and, and because of you know these investigations into Trump, or do you think he still has a pretty um, large influence on uh, the Republican Party and also remains a threat to democracy? He has a large influence. He remains a threat. His threat is less than it was. Uh, because of the rebuff that he received at the election. Um, Having said that, um, you know, I think it's very important to distinguish Trump from Trumpism or Trump from right-wing movements that are fundamentally anti-democratic, fundamentally uh, push us towards greater minority rule in the United States um, and put our institutions of democracy at greater risk. Uh, Every single one of the latter group of threats is stronger today, even if Trump is somewhat weaker. And having said that, how amazing is it that here we are on January 6, 2023, two years after what he did. Trump's out there. He's the leading candidate. He gets on TV all that he wants. The people who arranged this with him are out there. Uh, The guy who is being nominated over and over and over again to be Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, um, is noted primarily for having been the first Republican to go and embrace Trump after the coup. Um, The the people uh, who are the leaders of the party around him 
are all election deniers. It's like it never happened. You know, it's like they were rewarded for this assault on our system of government. And, you know, everybody, you know, I mean, I look at Twitter, you know, and there's a feed and everybody's like, well, I remember I got goosebumps watching, you know, this or chills ran up my spine. Chills should be running up your spine right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, watching what has happened to all of these people and how our response to it has been anemic. I mean, so you mentioned the um, House Speaker battle right now, and, um, and and I think you can't really separate, and I think you, you said it much more eloquently than I can, but they're, January 6th and what we're seeing right now are connected in, in some ways. And so I'm, walking, I'm wondering if you can walk our audience through that connection. I mean, to me, it seems like Kevin McCarthy and, and like you said, those <laughs> Republicans who are um, getting nominated, Byron Donalds was also someone who denied the election results, Kevin McCarthy, um, and I think there was a stat that said 147 members members who are still serving right now who denied the certification of election results in 2020. And so it seems like the threat to democracy is is still ongoing and that the threat that January 6th posed is, is still happening right now in Congress. So um, do you do you read it the same way? Well, of course. Look, the people who stood up and said this is wrong, they've been effectively purged from the Republican Party. Um, you know, uh, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinziger, and a bunch of the others, and they've been they've been kicked out of the party. Um, uh, the people who are in leadership positions are, are either election deniers or Trump defenders or Trump defenders and election deniers. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, it it doesn't look like that movement is slowing down. Now, having said that, you know, put it in a historical perspective, this is not. Um, purely a recent phenomenon. Certainly Trump exacerbated and made worse many things. Certainly we've never seen anything like we saw on January 6th. But the Republican Party for the past 40 years has been oriented towards attacking government, saying government was the problem, weakening government. Um, and, uh, you know, that started with Ronald Reagan, not Do Donald Trump. I mean, it started even before that. Um, but we attacking our institutions, saying government is the problem, is the foundation of this whole thing. And at the same time, um, you know, I think even more fundamental to, than that is that this is a, a, a movement designed to preserve the power of the white male minority yeah, that yeah. had been controlling this country for 240 years. And, uh, you know, they have realized that by 2043, we're going to be a minority majority nation, that, the, the, that their power is going to be limited by democracy if it functions properly. And their conclusion is, OK, then let's not have it function properly. And they've capitalized on loopholes within the Constitution and they've capitalized on their ability to place senior people in the court system to essentially impose crazy views that concentrate more power in their hands, uh, uh, you know, without uh, uh, respect for precedent or the law. Uh, and, you know, I mean, look at them. And, I, you know, I don't mean to go on, but Citizens United, which essentially said money is speech. What did that do? Well, it said that means if you have more money, you have more speech. Well, who had more money? Um, you know, they they said, oh, we don't need a Voting Rights Act anymore. You know, we're we're over that. Uh, clearly, we do. But they came up with a rationale for doing it. Um, uh, and so, and the court could later this year say, you know what, state legislatures are really the final yeah. arbiter in all of this. And they could strip away the ability of uh, any anybody acting at a federal level to impose oversight, including uh, uh, state courts. Uh, you know, so you know a, a big big range of people who want to defend democracy wouldn't be allowed to do that. And so, you know, what you're dealing with here is a concerted, decades long effort to impose minority rule in the United States and to pervert democracy 
so that it serves that minority at the expense of everybody else. And it's not just political expense, by the way. Over that 40-year period, we've also seen inequality grow in the United States. We've seen the people who have, we've seen the 1% and the tenth of 1% get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier at the expense of everybody else. So these are these are bigger macro trends. And we do ourselves a disservice and, and invite a risk if we identify them with any one individual. So you paint a tearing, terrifying photo for us. And I think everything is, is so um, true, what you just said. And, and I, I, I want to empower our audience. So when you listen to that, it's like, where do you even begin to start um, to, to, to solve these issues? What are some things that you think just voters, the American people can do to to fix the situation. I mean, it, the problems are so large. How do we respond to them? Well, I think we respond to it by taking it seriously. You know, you've been a very important voice for young voters. Uh, if young voters voted with at the same um, uh, percentages of, of participation as other voting groups, the Republicans would never win another election. Young voters have different priorities. You know, young voters understand that climate is an existential threat and not an issue that can be relegated to the children's table. Uh, they understand uh, that unless the system uh, is reworked dramatically, they will never have the opportunity that their parents had to own a home, to get college debt off of their backs, to have real opportunity to grow in society. Um, so, mobilize the voters that can make a difference, starting with young voters uh, and then continuing to the voters who the Republican Party wants to disenfranchise. Yeah. And that includes voters of color. It includes women. It includes urban voters. And it includes people who are in the 90 percent who are being edged out of the economic opportunity zone in this economy. Uh, but if you do all those things, then I can be optimistic because that's the majority of the American people. And if we can restore majority rule in the United States, we can shut this down. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the system's being rigged against us and we don't have an unlimited amount of time to do that. Absolutely. Well, we'll see what happens with this uh, speaker battle. I, I, I hope that it gets resolved somehow um, and, and we can turn to a functioning um, Congress, although I'm, I'm not sure how possible that is these days. But there are talks about some sort of power sharing agreement maybe between Democrats and Republicans, and that could be a good scenario. But I think what's happening right now shows the American people just how important it is to return to, um, I, I think, a government that works for us. And like you said, a majority rule where um, you know you, you have people going out there voting um, and, and improving their lives. But I want to turn to um, one one last thing, which is a recent piece that you wrote for the Daily Beast um, about some of the top U.S. national security flashpoints of 2023. Talk about that a little bit and, and what we should be paying attention to in this new year when it comes <clears throat> to national security. Well, look, I mean, uh, when, we, when it comes to national security, uh, you know, the top issue on, on everybody's mind right now, uh, overseas issues, probably Ukraine. Right. Um, but uh you know, I think we should pause that a second and note that what we've just been talking about for the past 20 minutes is the top national security threat. Hmm. Um, you know, th a domestic extremism has been identified by the FBI, including, you know, people like, you know, Chris Ray, not super, super lefty voices as the number one threat in the country. Uh, if our institutions are weakened, we are weakened. Our standing in the world is weakened. And so that's the top national security threat. Overseas, um, this year is going to be very important in terms of how the Ukraine battle plays out. If Ukraine can survive, and I think there's some signs that Ukraine is starting to get the kind of support it needs, um, uh, including light tanks and 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 maybe soon, uh, you know, uh, uh, even... Uh, you know, heavier um, battle tanks, um, uh, more missiles, more precision weapons, and so forth. Well, they can defeat the army of one of the greatest threats we face, the Russians. Um, 
there is, a, you know, there are issues associated with that that we have to be aware of. Putin is old. He's ill. He's losing. Uh, and, you know, I think pressure on him is going to grow and unrest in Russia carries with it a whole lot of question marks. We also seeing unrest, by the way, in Iran and in China. Uh, both of those things are things we have to keep an eye on. The government in Israel is now extremely right wing and embracing uh, attitudes that are deeply worrisome with regard to the Palestinians, but also as of a couple of days ago, saying, no, no, we are closer to Russia. We're not going to criticize Russia and Ukraine. That's something to be worried about. Um, uh, I, I think in a world in which uh, you know, we have neglected the issue of climate for so long, extreme weather incidents are likely to produce uh, not just immediate pain, but droughts and the dislocations caused by these things produce refugees and, and, and trans-border pressures that are um, really significant. Um, I don't think we're going to, you know, see the U.S. and China fighting over Taiwan anytime soon, uh, but I, particularly because I think the Chinese have a number of domestic issues they need to address. You now, if Kevin McCarthy becomes speaker and he gets on a plane and flies to Taiwan like Nancy Pelosi did, the Chinese are going to do exactly what they did when Nancy Pelosi went there, and we're going to go through a period of, of tension around that. Yeah. I also think we're entering a period in which um, uh, cyber threats exist, uh, state-sponsored, non-state-sponsored, uh, that will inevitably uh, disrupt our lives and that those are augmented um, by, uh, I think, an underappreciated set of threats that are, are not cyber per se, they're information threats, disinformation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, abuse of, of, of information systems by foreign governments and malevolent actors. So there's, you know, there, there's, there's plenty to keep an eye on, uh, but just to go back to your opening point, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that if we can't get our house in order at home, we don't defend our system at home, all this other stuff is secondary. Absolutely. David, thank you so much for joining us and enlightening us on um, national security and also some of the news of the day. Um, I am so grateful and um, hopefully you have a great new year and we'll see what happens with this uh, new, new house. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Victor. And uh, thanks for all you're doing. Uh, and you've been an important voice that has emerged on the scene. Uh, and I just wish you luck because it's an important message. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Well, that was an interesting episode, and we will definitely keep on uh, looking at some of the national security threats to our nation because they do pose a continued threat. Um, before we end uh, today's episode, I do have a couple of news of the day that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, the first is some news that I just got in my inbox about the economy, and there's great economic news under President Biden's leadership, contrary to what Republicans are going to say about how President Biden is so ineffective and incompetent when it comes to the economy. The numbers prove otherwise. Um, the unemployment rate hit an all-time, or not all-time, but a 50-year low. Uh, jobs are up. Wages are up. Um, there are great signs the economy is growing and surging. And, you know, meanwhile, I don't think we can forget that Republicans who ran their entire 2022 campaign on lower inflation and, and solving the economy still have no concrete plan to solve that and to ease inflation and to help grow the economy. So you have, again, two really different realities right now. You have the Democratic Party and President Biden, who has really, really helped the economy right now. You're seeing great signs. And then uh, the Republican Party still has no plan. So um, that's the choice that we face right now um, uh, when it comes to the economy. And I think great news coming out of today. It's um, President Biden made a statement and he said, it's a great day to be an American worker. And that's so true. So we should be, all be grateful for this good economy right now. Um, President Biden will also uh, offer the Presidential Medal of Freedom at 2 p.m. Eastern today to 12 people. And I just want to read off some of the people because they are all somehow related to the January 6th, uh, protecting democracy on January 6th and in and, and the 2020 election. Um, you guys may remember Metropolitan Police Officer Daniel Hodges, Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman, Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn, Capitol Police Officer Carolyn Edwards, 
uh, retired now um, Capitol Police Sergeant uh, Aquino uh, Jonal and retired Metropolitan Police Officer Michael Fanone. So those are some of the people uh, who protected our democracy on that day um, who are getting the Presidential Medal of Freedom today. And then he's also going to honor um, people like uh, Brian Sicknick, who um, died on January 6th. Uh, he's also going to um, give the honor to people like Rusty Bowers and Jocelyn Benson and um, Al Schmidt of Pennsylvania, who really had an important role in protecting elections from being overthrown turn. Um, he'll also give the award to two people who you may remember from the January 6th um, uh, uh, testimonies. And those include Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman. You remember those two were just ordinary election workers who did their part and helped uh, protect our democracy by signing up as an election workers and, and helping people access the ballot. And then they were subject of a long list of um, attacks by the former president, so much so that their lives were completely changed. And so um, they are really the front lines of democracy and help protect our democracy on that day. And so um, all of those people will be getting the president medal of freedom and so well deserved because um you know we're two years after this this day and, and i think it's important for us never to lose sight of just how much of a threat um donald trump continues to pose and on that day how coordinated everything was this was intentional this was planned out from the beginning and they were really close to doing uh what they sought out to do which is overthrow democracy and overthrow government and disrupt the peaceful transfer of power so We'll all be thinking of that. And then, like I said at the beginning, today's day four of the Republican fiasco. Kevin McCarthy is going to try to become Speaker of the House again. My prediction, he's probably not going to get there today. It's day four. That means that people are still not being paid. Members have still not been sworn in. And um, it's just a pretty sad reality. And, you know, you wonder who in the Republican conference can even get to 218. I'm not sure. And so I think right now the only path forward is working with Democrats to work out some sort of agreement. And I think maybe a power sharing agreement or electing Hakeem Jeffries. But um, I, I still don't think Kevin McCarthy has a vote. So we'll be paying attention to all of that. And um, we'll be back next week, starting on Monday, all the way through Friday with new episodes of On The Move every day, live at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, be sure to send us your questions. I'll get to them uh, on our Thursday Ask Me Anything. So uh, send me your questions and I'll try to get to them. And next week, we have some great guests coming up um, talking about what's happened this week, um, some of the threats to democracy. Um, so stay tuned for that. You will not want to miss it. You can find it right here again at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time every weekday on youtube.com slash Politicon. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. I hope all of you have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I will see you all next Monday.